CSS Alabama was a screw sloop of war built in 1862 for the Confederate States Navy at Birkenhead on the River Mersey opposite Liverpool, England by John Laird Sons and Company. Alabama served as a successful commerce raider, attacking Union merchant and naval ships over the course of her two year career, during which she never docked at a southern port. She was sunk in June 1864 by USS Kearsarge at the Battle of Cherbourg outside the port of Cherbourg, France. History Construction Alabama was built in secrecy in 1862 by British shipbuilders John Laird Sons and Company, in northwest England at their shipyards at Birkenhead, Wirral, opposite Liverpool. The construction was arranged by the Confederate agent Commander James Bullock, who led the procurement of sorely needed ships for the fledgling Confederate States Navy. The contract was arranged through the Fraser Trenholm Company, a cotton broker in Liverpool with ties to the Confederacy. Under prevailing British neutrality law, it was possible to build a ship designed as an armed vessel, provided that it wasn't actually armed until after it sailed into international waters. In light of this loophole, Alabama was built with reinforced decks for cannon emplacements, ammunition magazines below water level, etc., but the builder stopped short of fitting her out with armaments or any warlike equipment. Initially known as Hull No. 290. To hide her identity, the ship was launched as Enrica on 15 May 1862 and secretly slipped out of Birkenhead on 29 July 1862. Union Captain Tunis A. M. Craven, commander of USS Tuscarora, was in Southampton and was tasked with intercepting the new ship, but was unsuccessful. Agent Bullock arranged for a civilian crew and captain to sail Enrica to Tercera Island in the Azores. With Bullock at his side, the new ship's captain, Raphael Semmes, left Liverpool on 13 August 1862 aboard the steamer Bahama to take command of the new cruiser. Semmes arrived at Tercera Island on 20 August 1862 and began overseeing the refitting of the new vessel with various provisions, including armaments, and 350 tons of coal, brought there by Agrippina, his new ship supply vessel. After three days of back-breaking work by the three ships' crews, Enrica was equipped as a naval cruiser, designated a commerce raider, for the Confederate States of America. Following her commissioning as CSS Alabama, Bullock then returned to Liverpool to continue his secret work for the Confederate Navy. Alabama's British made ordnance was composed of six muzzle loading, broadside, 32 pounder naval smoothbores, three firing to port and three firing to starboard, and two larger and more powerful pivot cannons. The pivot cannons were placed fore and aft of the main mast and positioned roughly amidships along the deck center line. From those positions, they could be rotated to fire across the port or starboard sides of the cruiser. The four-pivot cannon was a heavy, long-range 100-pounder, 7-inch bore 178 mm Blakely rifled muzzle loader, the aft pivot cannon a large, 8-inch 203 mm smoothbore. 
The new Confederate cruiser was powered by both sail and by two John Laird Sons and Company 300 horsepower, 220 kilowatts horizontal steam engines, driving a single Griffiths type twin bladed brass screw. With the screw retracted using the stern's brass lifting gear mechanism, Alabama could make up to 10 knots under sail alone and 13.25 knots when her sail and steam power were used together. Topic. Commissioning and voyage The ship was purposely commissioned about a mile off Tercera Island in international waters on 24 August 1862. All the men from Agrippina and Bahama had been transferred to the quarter deck of Enrica, where her 24 officers, some of them Southerners, stood in full dress uniform. Captain Raphael Semmes mounted a gun carriage and read his commission from President Jefferson Davis, authorizing him to take command of the new cruiser. Upon completion of the reading, musicians that assembled from among the three ship's crews began to play the tune, Dixie, just as the quartermaster finished hauling down Enrica's British colours. A signal cannon boomed and the stops to the halyards at the peaks of the mizzen gaff and mainmast were broken and the ship's new battle ensign and commissioning pennant floated free on the breeze. With that the cruiser became Confederate States Steamer Alabama. The ship's motto, Aide toi et Dieu tadera, French for, God helps those who help themselves was engraved in the bronze of the great double ship's wheel. Captain Semmes then made a speech about the Southern cause to the assembled seamen, few of whom were American, asking them to sign on for a voyage of unknown length and destiny. Semmes had only his 24 officers and no crew to man his new command. When this did not succeed, Semmes changed his tack. He offered signing money and double wages, paid in gold, and additional prize money to be paid by the Confederate Congress for all destroyed Union ships. When the men began to shout, Here! Here! Semmes knew he had closed the deal. Eighty three seamen, many of them British, signed on for service in the Confederate Navy. Confederate agent Bullock and the remaining seamen then returned to their respective ships for their return voyage to England. Semmes still needed another 20 or so men for a full crew complement, but enough had signed on to at least handle the new commerce raider. The rest would be recruited from among captured crews of raided ships or from friendly ports of call. Of the original 83 crewmen that signed on that day, many completed the full voyage. Under Captain Semmes, Alabama spent her first two months in the eastern Atlantic, ranging southwest of the Azores and then redoubling east, capturing and burning northern merchant ships. After a difficult Atlantic crossing, she then continued her path of destruction and devastation in the greater New England region. She then sailed south, arriving in the West Indies where she raised more havoc before finally cruising west into the Gulf of Mexico. There, in January 1863, Alabama had her first military engagement. She came upon and quickly sank the Union side wheeler USS Hatteras just off the Texas coast, near Galveston, capturing that warship's crew. 
She then continued further south, eventually crossing the equator, where she took the most prizes of her raiding career while cruising off the coast of Brazil. After a second, easterly Atlantic crossing, Alabama sailed down the southwestern African coast where she continued her war against northern commerce. After stopping in Saldanha Bay on 29 July 1863 in order to verify that no enemy ships were in Table Bay, she finally made a much-needed refitting and reprovisioning visit to Cape Town, South Africa. Alabama is the subject of an Afrikaans folk song, Dar Kom Die Alibama still popular in South Africa today. She then sailed for the East Indies, where she spent six months destroying seven more ships before finally redoubling the Cape of Good Hope en route to France. Union warships hunted frequently for the elusive and by now famous Confederate raider, but the few times Alabama was spotted, she quickly outwitted her pursuers and vanished over the horizon. Altogether, she burned 65 Union vessels of various types, most of them merchant ships. During all of Alabama's raiding ventures, captured ships' crews and passengers were never harmed, only detained until they could be placed aboard a neutral ship or placed ashore in a friendly or neutral port. <laughs> Expeditionary raids Altogether, Alabama conducted a total of seven expeditionary raids, spanning the globe, before heading to France for refit and repairs. The CSS Alabama's Eastern Atlantic Expeditionary Raid August-September, 1862 commenced immediately after she was commissioned. She immediately set sail for the shipping lanes southwest and then east of the Azores, where she captured and burned ten prizes, mostly whalers. The CSS Alabama's New England Expeditionary Raid October to November, 1862 began after Captain Semmes and his crew departed for the northeastern seaboard of North America, along Newfoundland and New England, where she ranged as far south as Bermuda and the coast of Virginia, burning ten prizes while capturing and releasing three others. The CSS Alabama's Gulf of Mexico Expeditionary Raid December, 1862, January, 1863, was centered around a needed rendezvous with her supply vessel, CSS Agrippina. After that, she rendered aid to Texas during Major General Banks' invasion near Galveston, Texas. There, she quickly sank the Union side wheeler USS Hatteras. The CSS Alabama's South Atlantic Expeditionary Raid February to July, 1863 was her most successful raiding venture, taking 29 prizes while raiding off the coast of Brazil. Here she recommissioned the Bark Conrad as the CSS Tuscaloosa. The CSS Alabama's South African Expeditionary Raid August-September, 1863 occurred primarily while ranging off the coast of South Africa, as she worked together with the CSS Tuscaloosa. The CSS Alabama's Indian Ocean Expeditionary Raid September to November, 1863 was composed of a nearly 4,500-mile journey across the Indian Ocean. Successfully evading the Union gunboat Wyoming she took three prizes near the Sunda Strait and the Java Sea. 
The CSS Alabama's South Pacific Expeditionary Raid December, 1863, was her final raiding venture. She took a few prizes in the Strait of Malacca before finally turning back toward France for a much needed refit and long overdue repairs. Upon the completion of her seven expeditionary raids, Alabama had been at sea for 534 days out of 657, never visiting a single Confederate port. She boarded nearly 450 vessels, captured or burned 65 Union merchant ships, and took more than 2,000 prisoners without a single loss of life from either prisoners or her own crew. <laughs> Final cruise On the 11th of June 1864, Alabama arrived in port at Cherbourg, France. Captain Semmes soon requested permission to dry dock and overhaul his ship, much needed after so long a time at sea and so many naval actions. Pursuing the raider, the American sloop of war, USS Kearsarg, under the command of Captain John and Crum Winslow, arrived three days later and took up station just outside the harbor. While at his previous port of call, Winslow had telegraphed Gibraltar to send the old sloop of war USS St. Louis with provisions and to provide blockading assistance. Kearsarg now had Alabama boxed in with no place left to run. Having no desire to see his worn-out ship rot away at a French dock while quarantined by Union warships and given his instinctive aggressiveness and a long-held desire once again to engage his enemy, Captain Semmes chose to fight. After preparing his ship and drilling the crew for the coming battle during the next several days, Semmes issued, through diplomatic channels, a bold challenge or hoped for intimidation to the Kearsarg's commander. My intention is to fight the Kearsarg as soon as I can make the necessary arrangements. I hope these will not detain me more than until tomorrow or the morrow morning at farthest. I beg she will not depart until I am ready to go out. I have the honor to be your obedient servant, R. Semmes, Captain. On 19 June, Alabama sailed out to meet the Union cruiser. Jurist Tom Bingham later wrote, "...the ensuing battle was witnessed by Manet, who went out to paint it, and the owner of an English yacht who had offered his children a choice between watching the battle and going to church." As Kearsarg turned to meet her opponent, Alabama opened fire. Kearsarg waited patiently until the range had closed to less than 1,000 yards 900 meters. According to survivors, the two ships steamed on opposite courses in seven spiraling circles, moving southwesterly with the three-knot current, each commander trying to cross the bow of his opponent to deliver a heavy raking fire to cross the T. The battle quickly turned against Alabama due to the superior gunnery displayed by Kearsarg and the deteriorated state of Alabama's contaminated powder and fuses. Her most telling shot, fired from the forward 7-inch Blakely pivot rifle, hit very near Kearsarg's vulnerable stern post, the impact binding the ship's rudder badly. That rifled shell, however, failed to explode. If it had done so, it would have seriously disabled Kearsarg's steering, possibly sinking the warship, and ending the contest. 
In addition, Alabama's too rapid rate of fire resulted in frequent poor gunnery, with many of her shots going too high, and as a result Kearsarg benefited little that day from the protection of her outboard chain armor. Semmes later said that the armor on Kearsarg was unknown to him at the time of his decision to issue the challenge to fight, and in the years that followed Semmes steadfastly claimed he would have never fought Kearsarg if he had known she was armor-clad. Kearsarg's hull armor had been installed in just three days, more than a year before, while she was in port at the Azores. It was made using 120 fathoms, 720 feet, 220 meters of 1.7 inch, 43 millimeters single link iron chain and covered hull spaces 49 feet 6 inches, 15.09 meters long by 6 feet 2 inches, 1.88 meters deep. It was stopped up and down to eye bolts with marlines and secured by iron dogs. Her chain armor was concealed behind one-inch deal boards painted black to match the upper hull's color. This chain cladding was placed along Kearsarg's port and starboard midsection down to the water line, for additional protection of her engine and boilers when the upper portion of her coal bunkers were empty coal bunkers played an important part in the protection of early steam vessels, such as protected cruisers. A hit to her engine or boilers could easily leave Kearsarg dead in the water and vulnerable, or even cause a boiler explosion or fire that could destroy the cruiser. Her armor belt was hit twice during the fight, first in the starboard gangway by one of Alabama's 32-pounder shells that cut the chain armor, denting the hull planking underneath, then again by a second 32-pounder shell that exploded and broke a link of the chain armor, tearing away a portion of the deal board covering. If those rounds had come from Alabama's more powerful 100-pounder Blakely pivot rifle, they would have easily penetrated, but the likely result would not have been very serious, as both shots struck the hull a little more than five feet above the waterline. Even if both shots had penetrated Kearsarg's side, they would have completely missed her vital machinery. However, a 100-pound shell could have done a great deal of damage to her interior and nearby crewmen, hot fragments could have easily set fire to the cruiser, one of the greatest risks aboard a wooden vessel. A little more than an hour after the first shot was fired, Alabama was reduced to a sinking wreck by Kearsarg's powerful 11-inch mm Dahlgrens, forcing Captain Semmes to strike his colors and to send one of his two surviving boats to Kearsarg to ask for assistance. According to witnesses, Alabama fired 370 rounds at her adversary, averaging one round per minute per gun, a very fast rate of fire, while Kearsarg's gun crews fired less than half that number, taking more careful aim. During the confusion of battle, five more rounds were fired at Alabama after her colors were struck, her gun ports had been left open and the broadside cannon were still run out, appearing to come to bear on Kearsarg, then a handheld white flag came fluttering from Alabama's stern spanker boom, finally halting the engagement. Prior to this, she had her steering gear compromised by shell hits, but the fatal shot came later when one of Kearsarg's 11-inch mm shells tore open a midsection of Alabama's starboard waterline. 
water quickly rushed through the defeated cruiser, eventually drowning her boilers and forcing her down by the stern to the bottom. As Alabama sank, the injured Semmes threw his sword into the sea, depriving Kearsarg's commander Captain John and Crum Winslow of the traditional surrender ceremony of having it handed over to him as victor an act which was seen as dishonorable by many at the time. Kearsarg rescued the majority of the survivors, but 41 of Alabama's officers and crew, including Semmes, were rescued by John Lancaster's private British steam yacht Deerhound, while Kearsarg stood off to recover her rescue boats as Alabama sank. Captain Winslow was forced to stand by helplessly and watch Deerhound Spirit away to England his much sought after adversary, Captain Semmes, and his surviving shipmates. The sinking of Alabama by Kearsarg is honored by the United States Navy with a battle star on the Civil War campaign streamer. Topic Officers O died in Saldanha Bay from accidental gunshot on the third of August eighteen sixty three. B drowned in the sinking of the Alabama the nineteenth of June eighteen sixty four. CLT of CS Marines. Brother-in-law of C.S. President Jefferson Davis D. Drowned in the sinking of the Alabama 19 June 1864 E. Killed in action in the sinking of the Alabama 19 June 1864 Confederate Medal of Honor awarded for valor Perhaps the most courageous and selfless act during Alabama's last moments involved the ship's assistant surgeon, Dr. David Herbert Llewellyn. Dr. Llewellyn, a Briton, was much loved and respected by the entire crew. During the battle, he steadfastly remained at his post in the wardroom tending the wounded until the order to abandon ship was finally given. As he helped wounded men into Alabama's only two functional lifeboats, an able-bodied sailor attempted to enter one, which was already full. Llewellyn, understanding that the man risked capsizing the craft, grabbed and pulled him back, saying, See, I want to save my life as much as you do, but let the wounded men be saved first. An officer in the boat, seeing that Llewellyn was about to be left aboard the stricken Alabama, shouted, Doctor, we can make room for you. Llewellyn shook his head and replied, I will not peril the wounded. Unknown to the crew, Llewellyn had never learned to swim, and he drowned when the ship went down. His sacrifice did not go unrecognized. The Confederacy awarded him posthumously the Confederate Medal of Honor and the medal was finally minted and presented in 1977 by the Sons of Confederate Veterans. In his native village, a memorial window and tablet were placed at Easton Royal Church. Another tablet was placed in Charing Cross Hospital, London, where he attended medical school. Topic. Repercussions During her two-year career as a commerce raider, Alabama damaged Union merchant shipping around the world. 
The Confederate cruiser claimed 65 prizes valued at nearly $6 million, approximately $94 million in today's dollars. In 1862 alone, 28 were claimed. In an important development in international law, the U.S. government pursued the Alabama claims against Great Britain for the losses caused by Alabama and other raiders fitted out in Britain. A joint arbitration commission awarded the U.S. $15.5 million in damages. Ironically, in 1851, a decade before the Civil War, Captain Semmes had observed, Commerce raiders are little better than licensed pirates, and it behooves all civilized nations to suppress the practice altogether. However, she and other raiders failed in their primary purpose, which was to draw Union vessels away from the blockade of the southern coastline, which was slowly strangling the Confederacy. The Confederate government had hoped that the panic of the shipping companies would force the Union to dispatch ships to protect merchant shipping and hunt down the raiders, a task which always requires a proportionately greater force when compared with the numbers of ships attacking see Battle of the Atlantic. Union officials proved immovable on the blockade, however, and although insurance prices soared, shipping costs went up, and many vessels transferred to a neutral flag, very few naval vessels were taken off the southern blockade. In fact, with clever utilization of resources and a mammoth shipbuilding program, the Union managed to steadily increase the blockade throughout the war. It also sent vessels to protect merchant shipping and to hunt down and destroy the few Confederate raiders and privateers still operating. The wreck In November 1984, the French Navy mine hunter Circe discovered a wreck under nearly 200 feet 60 meters of water off Cherbourg at 49 degrees 45 minutes 9 seconds north 1 degree 41 minutes 42 seconds west. Captain Max Garout later confirmed the wreck to be Alabama's remains. In 1988, a non-profit organization, the CSS Alabama Association, was founded to conduct scientific exploration of the shipwreck. Although the wreck resides within French territorial waters, the United States government, as the successor to the former Confederate States of America, is the owner. On October 3, 1989, the United States and France signed an agreement recognizing this wreck as an important heritage resource of both nations and establishing a joint French-American Scientific Committee for Archaeological Exploration. This agreement established a precedent for international cooperation in archaeological research and in the protection of a unique historic shipwreck. The association CSS Alabama and the Naval History and Heritage Command signed on March 23, 1995 an official agreement accrediting association CSS Alabama as operator of the archaeological investigation of the remains of the ship. The association, which is funded solely from private donations, is continuing to make this an international project through its fundraising in France and in the United States, thanks to its sister organization, the CSS Alabama Association, incorporated in the state of Delaware. 
Alabama was fitted with eight pieces of ordnance after she arrived at the Azores, six of those were 32-pounder smooth bores. Seven cannon were identified at the wreck site, two were cast from a British Royal Navy pattern and three were of a later pattern produced by Fawcett, Preston, and Company in Liverpool. One of the Blakely pattern 32-pounders was found lying across the starboard side of the hull, forward of the boilers. A second Blakely 32-pounder was identified outside the hull structure, immediately forward of the propeller and its lifting frame. The forward 32-pounder was recovered in 2000. Both of the British Royal Navy pattern 32-pounders were identified, one lies inside the starboard hull, forward of the boilers, adjacent to the forward Downton pump. The second was identified as lying on the iron deck structure, immediately aft of the smoke pipe, it was recovered in 2001. The sole remaining 32-pounder has not been positively identified, but it could be underneath hull debris forward of the starboard Trotman anchor. Alabama's heavy ordnance were one Blakely patent 7-inch 100-pounder shell rifle mounted on a pivot carriage forward and one 68-pounder smoothbore similarly mounted aft. The Blakely 7-inch 100-pounder was found beside its pivot carriage, atop the forward starboard boiler. This was the first cannon recovered from Alabama. The 68-pounder smoothbore was located aft, at the stern, immediately outside the starboard hull structure. It is possible that the remains of its truck and pivot carriage lie underneath the gun tube. Both heavy cannon were recovered in 1994. In addition to the seven cannon, the wreck site contained shot, gun truck wheels, and brass tracks for the gun carriages. Many of the brass tracks were recovered. Two shot were recovered, and one conical projectile was inside the barrel of the 7 inch Blakely rifle. A shell for a 32-pounder was recovered from the stern, forward of the propeller, that shot was attached to a wood sabot having been packed in a wood box for storage. Additional round shot were observed scattered forward of the boilers and in the vicinity of the aft pivot gun, one possibly having been fired from Kearsarg. In 2002, a diving expedition raised the ship's bell along with more than 300 other artifacts, including more cannons, structural samples, tableware, ornate commodes, and numerous other items that reveal much about life aboard the Confederate warship. Many of the artifacts are now housed in the Underwater Archaeology Branch, Naval History and Heritage Command Conservation Lab. <laughs> Folklore and heritage Alabama is the subject of a sea shanty, Roll Alabama, Roll, Alabama's visit to Cape Town in 1863 has passed with a slight spelling change into South African folklore in the Afrikaans song, Dar Kom Di Alibama, the Alabama Hills in Inyo County, California, are named after the vessel. Topic. Battle ensigns and other naval flags The practice of using primary and secondary naval flags after the British tradition was common practice for the Confederacy, linked as she was by both heritage and economy to the British Isles. 
The fledgling Confederate Navy therefore adopted and used jacks, commissioning pennants, battle ensigns, small boat ensigns, designating flags, and signal flags aboard its warships during the Civil War. Topic: <laughs> Surviving stars and bars. At the beginning of Alabama's raiding ventures, the newly commissioned cruiser may have been forced, out of necessity, to fly the only battle ensign available to Captain Semmes, an early 1861, seven-star first national flag, possibly the same battle ensign flown aboard his previous command, the smaller commerce raider CSS Sumter. Between 21 May and 28 November 1861, six more southern states seceded and joined the Confederacy. Well before Alabama was launched as Enrica at Birkenhead, Merseyside in northwest England, six more white, five-pointed stars had been added to the "'Stars and Bars' far away across the Atlantic on the Confederate mainland. One such early, "'Stars and Bars' battle ensign was salvaged from Alabama's floating debris, following her sinking by Kearsarg. It still survives and is held by the Alabama Department of Archives and History. It is listed there as Auxiliary flag of the CSS. Alabama, Catalog No. 86.3766.1. According to their provenance reconstruction, DeCoste Smith, an American from New England, discovered this. Stars and Bars. Ensign in a Paris upholstery shop in 1884, where he purchased it for 15 francs. Smith's nephew, Clement Sawtell of Lincoln Square, Massachusetts, later inherited the ensign from his uncle. At the suggestion of retired Rear Admiral Beverly M. Coleman, Sawtell donated it to the state of Alabama on 3 June 1975. This battle ensign's overall dimensions are different from the Confederate flag regulations required 2 to 3 ratio. It is 64 inches high hoist by 112 inches long fly, a proportion of 5 to 9, and its dark blue canton contains eight white stars, 8 inches 203 millimeters high. In an unusual arrangement, the stars are not organized in a circle but configured in three, centered, horizontal rows of two, then three, and finally two. The additional eighth star is tucked into the lower left corner and in the lower right corner on the opposite side, giving the canton's layout a unique, asymmetrical appearance. It seems plausible this was Alabama's original seven-star battle ensign, possibly flown aboard CSS Sumter as noted earlier, and later altered at some point when the long-delayed news of an eighth state joining the Confederacy finally reached the far-distant cruiser. 2. Star and Bars Battle ensigns, labeled as having belonged to Alabama, also still exist. The first is a mounted and framed, 14-star ensign located at the Mariner's Museum in Virginia. A small number of these unusual 14-star national flags have survived to the modern era and are held in several Civil War archives. From the several color photo available on the Internet, this ensign appears to have an approximate hoist-to-fly aspect ratio of 1 to 2. 2.5 i.e., very rectangular. A second, Stars and Bars, battle ensign is on display at the Pensacola Historical Museum. 
Its canton contains a circle of 12 stars surrounding a centered, larger 13th star. <inaudible> Surviving stainless banners Four of Alabama's later style ensigns have survived to the modern era. The first measures 67 in times 114 in 170 centimeters times 290 centimeters and is located in South Africa at Cape Town's Bo Kaap Museum. Its southern cross canton is oversize and very rectangular, in British Navy fashion, instead of square, in a roughly 1 to 2 aspect ratio. It was also made without the usual white stripes outlining its diagonal blue bars. A central white star, located where the two blue saltiers cross, is larger than the surrounding twelve stars. This ensign is believed to have been made aboard by her British crew sometime between Alabama's two visits to Cape Town. This ensign was given to Willem Anderson, whose ship Chandler Company made repairs to CSS Alabama, shortly before she made her fateful return voyage to Cherbourg, France. A second stainless banner ensign of South African origin was made and then presented to Alabama on one of her two port visits to Cape Town. It resides in the Tennessee State Museum, according to their website. The third surviving stainless banner is one of Alabama's original small boat ensigns. This official looking 25.5 in times 41 in 65 centimeters times 104 centimeters ensign is marked in brown pigment on its hoist. Alabama 290 CSN first cutter. In 2007 it was offered and sold through Philip Weiss Auctions. This ensign was being sold by the grandson of its second owner, who had originally purchased it from the granddaughter of a USS Kearsarg sailor. Its buyer has since sold this small boat ensign through a later auction. A fourth surviving ensign appears, from various clues observed in online photos, to be roughly 36 in times 54 in 91 centimeters times 137 centimeters. Because Alabama was forced to replace several of her original small boats lost at different times during her lengthy cruise, this is likely a larger replacement boat ensign. While it could have been made aboard, its somewhat more accurate details suggest it might have been commissioned ashore during a port of call visit. This ensign was rescued from the sinking Alabama by W.P. Brooks, the cruiser's assistant engineer. It was last flown, along with other historic flags, during a ceremony held on the parade ground at Fort Pulaski, Ga, sometime during 1937. This ensign has since been mounted and framed and continues to reside with the Brooks family. Four modern photos of it can be found at the website for the Alabama Crew, a British based naval reenactor group. The Alabama Department of Archives and History has in its collection one more important stainless banner ensign listed as. Admiral Sem's flag, catalog no 86.1893.1, PN 10149-10150. Their provenance reconstruction shows that it was presented to Sem's after the sinking of Alabama by Lady de Hogton and other English ladies. 
Such presentations of ceremonial colors were uncommon to ship's captains of the Confederate Navy, but a few were known to have received such honors. This second national flag is huge and made of pure silk, giving it an elegant appearance. While this ensign is in a remarkable state of preservation, its large size and delicate condition have made its up-close details and measurements unavailable. When Semmes returned to the Confederacy from England, he brought this ceremonial stainless banner with him. It was inherited by his grandchildren, Raphael Semmes III and Mrs. Eunice Semmes Thorington. Following his sister's death, Raphael Semmes III donated the ensign to the state of Alabama on 19 September 1929. See also List of ships of the Confederate States Navy James Dunwoody Bullock, Confederate agent and uncle of Theodore Roosevelt who covertly bought the Alabama Irvine Bullock, James's half-brother who was the youngest midshipman and officer on the ship Blockade runners of the American Civil War Bibliography of American Civil War Naval History List of ships captured in the 19th century